Yeah, well, you're not missing much. Okay. And you're live. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Geoscience and Geoenergy webinar of 22nd of June 2023. This is 115th uh, webinar we have been uh, hosting with this young gentleman, Sebastian Geiger. Used to be at Heliot, but now uh, proudly at Tudelft. So equally proudly he was at Heliot Watt as well. So well, we gained him. So together with Sebastian, we are running this today and we have the pleasure and honor to host Rita uh, today to give us a lecture about hydrogen storage. I'm going to introduce her uh, in a moment to you. Uh, Rita uh, Okorafor is a assistant professor at Texas A&M University, specializing in the application of modern gas skills and techniques to address challenges associated with low carbon energy technologies. Rita earned her PhD in energy resources engineering from Stanford University. Prior to pursuing her doctorate, she was a principal reservoir engineer at SLB on organize, an organization she worked for about 13 years. During her tenure, she contributed her expertise to various product lines and locations. Her research encompasses several crucial areas, including geothermal reservoir engineering, carbon dioxide storage and utilization, and geologic storage of hydrogen and also reservoir geomechanics. By exploring these domains, Rita aims to unlock new possibilities for sustainable energy sources and improve the understanding and management of crucial energy resources. And I love this line at the end of her bio, which is outside work. She is an author of two novels. And I can't wait until she finishes her lecture and I ask which novels she has written. And it just, it's amazing, Rita, that you have been in industry for many years, a PhD at Stanford, and now professor in Texas a and I mean, this is impressive, really impressive. Thank you very much for for honoring us to accept this uh, invitation to give this lecture. We are very much looking forward to hearing your lecture, but also I need to know the name of your novels at the end of your talk. We will bother you with that. So okay. without any further ado, please, uh, we are all looking forward to hearing your lecture. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you all that are listening in. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you, Hadi and Sebastian. So very quickly, I'm going to take us through the agenda for today. I will start with an introduction and form a basis for what I'm going to talk about. And then I'm going to break down this discussion into three key parts. The first one is going to look at the insights from modeling of hydrogen storage in porous media. And then from those insights, how we use it to develop site selection criteria. And then in part to look at the impact of uncertainties in this site selection for hydrogen storage. The third part will look at key findings from preliminary geomechanical analysis. And then I'll bring this all together to talk about how site characterization and monitoring can help. And then of course, I'll come to a conclusion and answer Hadi's question later on. Okay, so um, what you see on the figure here is the projected growth of um, the demand for hydrogen coupled with this projected growth for the hydrogen demand and the need to complement intermittent renewable energy resources. There's been um, a lot of investigations towards how do we store hydrogen at scale. And to put this in perspective, when I was looking at the curtailed energy um, in California, Northern California, California um, I could see that from solar and wind, we have um, in a year about 1.3 to the power of 10, 10 to the power six megawatt hours of curtailed power. And this translates to 1.86 times 10 to the power eight meter cubes of hydrogen if we want to keep this on the surface. Now we would not have sufficient space on surface to store all of this, but if we bring in pressure and temperature, we should be able to reduce the amount of space required to store this amount of um, curtailed energy. This is only from California, by the way. So it's to show that the non-geologic storage technologies may not have sufficient storage capacities, and we have to look towards the geologic storage of hydrogen. Then there are different options which I'll talk about, but the experience with hydrogen storage in porous media is limited, 
and which has prompted investigations to look at how does this um, behave? What, what are you know, things that we need to understand about it? So my objective was, can we use numerical modeling and simulation to help us understand what are the key geologic and reservoir controls that would enable underground hydrogen storage? And so most of my talk would be related to um, modeling, um, reservoir modeling, geomechanical modeling. Um, a brief um, background on different geologic storage options. This list is not exhaustive, but I just want to put um, some um, background in the interest of um, the people who might be listening. We have salt caverns that have been used to store hydrogen. Um, one of the key things I want to highlight is that we have known successes with salt caverns. However, there is limitation in the locations where we can find salt caverns. So there is a geographical and also volume limitations. Now we know about saline aquifers, which we can, we can find almost everywhere, but there's little experience with storing hydrogen in as a pure hydrogen in saline um, aquifers. Again, we don't usually drill into saline aquifers to try to characterize it. So there's usually lack of data to characterize it. And we may just want to use information from offset wells or wildcat wells to give us some insights into those kind of reservoirs. Now with depleted oil and gas reservoirs, these are really well characterized. We know about them, we know their history in terms of pressures and volumes, um, but with depleted oil reservoirs, the presence of residual oil could cause some reactions that could impact um, hydrogen, affect its purity, and we may have hydrogen losses. On the other hand, um, depleted gas res reservoirs, which are well characterized, um, they do have their shortcomings, but they remain low hanging fruits because it's possible that if our objective is not to get pure hydrogen, we could still use depleted gas um, fields to store the hydrogen itself. The impact of um, the dissolution and residual oil will be less in this case. So um, with this four um, systems that I've talked about today, I'll be focusing on saline aquifers and depleted gas reservoirs as systems for storing hydrogen on the ground. So moving on to the first part, let's look at the insights we get from modeling hydrogen storage in porous media. On this slide, I put a hypothetical um, um, model. It's as homogeneous as it gets for us to be able to understand very simple things. Um, I put here also some of the properties that were used to build the model. Um, a few things I would like to highlight, we have not considered geochemical reactions, uh, microbial interactions, or even geomechanics in this particular model. Um, two, uh, two versions of the model were built. We have the model where we have some element of gas remaining in the reservoir, so to represent something like a depleted gas reservoir. In that case, the saturation of gas that I used was 0 0.3. And then for the saline aquifer, the saturation of water was one, of course, SG zero. There are so many other things that went into this model that I can put in here, things like um, solubility, salinity, um, diffusion, all of this. I can't list all of them here, but um, there are papers that I could refer you to that have all this information. In terms of the kind of schedule we're looking at, um, we start by um, filling up the reservoir with hydrogen. So this is what we see in red. And then we produce very um, large rates of the hydrogen, but for a short period. And it goes in repeated cycles of refilling for 50 days and production for seven days. So this is the cycle that we're looking at. Then in terms of the metrics for analyzing this information, um, I, I first of all bring the productivity index. So this is looking at the volume or the, 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 the cumulative um, rate of hydrogen that we're able to produce divided by the, by the energy that is used to produce it. Because the rate by itself is not sufficient. The um, BHP, the bottom hole pressure by itself is not sufficient. But if we think about that energy that we need to produce something, then we kind of are normalizing it. And so these are some of the equations that were used to get us to where it is. 
I use the cumulative divided by the time um, for a given time period because it was to help to get an average because this is a very cyclic nature. And so wanted to get some sort of average for the system. Then um, there was sensitivity analysis that was done to just give the preliminary insight into how does um, the reservoir behave or how, how much hydrogen can we withdraw depending on the kind of system that we have and to understand what parameters really affect the production or withdrawal of hydrogen. And so in the base value, these are all the parameters that were used, porosity, permeabilities, depth, etc. Um, then we have smaller values by 50% and larger values by 50%, um, except where we have the pressures and the deep. Of course, um, any percentage out of zero will be zero. So just to show that we created um, some boundaries for the deep. So in terms of the results, I will just show first of all what the base case results are putting together for the depleted gas field, which is what we see in A, and the um, saline aquifer. The way the model goes, we cannot see where the um, methane is because methane is assumed to be the gas in the reservoir. So um, over here we have um, hydrogen. We also have methane somewhere up here before we have water below. But in this case of saline aquifer, we have only hydrogen and water. So it may appear as though that there's so much hydrogen, but no, it's the same amount of hydrogen that was um, injected. Now, what we see is that with the case of the um, hydrogen in saline aquifer, we see that the hydrogen kind of spreads much further apart when it gets to the top. Whereas where we have a depleted field is kind of contained within the gas, there's pro probably gas mix mixing and which we also see when we look at the rates. Now, if we look at this part, the ones in dash are from the water bearing reservoir and we're able to withdraw complete hydrogen, pure hydrogen with no additional um, gas. But in the case where we have the depleted field, we have a combination of hydrogen and whatever is left for the amount of, um, for the rate we, um, we imposed on the system, whatever is left here is methane. What we see in the water bearing reservoir is that we have water production early on as we start to produce. So the effect of water cooling um, comes in, uh, which is not very evident. We don't, it's very small in the case of the depleted gas field. Now, when we did the sensitivity analysis, putting together the depleted gas field and the aquifer side by side, we see that the top ranking factors are the depth of the reservoir, formation deep permeability, formation thickness, and the current reservoir pressure. Um, let me explain this a little bit. So the blue implies that we have a smaller value than the base value. So for instance, the top of the reservoir is at 100 and at 1,000 meters, 50% of it um, leads us to 500 meters. 50% um, um, larger is 1.5. So this is what we have here. These are the productivity indices that we can read off the, the graph. And uh, we see that in this particular case, when we reduce our depth of our reservoir, that is, is shallower, we are able to get a higher PI for hydrogen, which means we are able to withdraw more at less energy or something like that. But the key thing that stands out is if we compare the PI to the depleted field to the aquifer, the PI is higher all through for the depleted field than the aquifer. And this is not surprising because when we want to inject hydrogen into the saline aquifer, we would need to you know, use much more pressure to push the water compared to if we have um, you know, gas within the system. Um, we see that the reservoir depth, the pressure, the deep, and the thickness were top impacting factors across all cases. Permeability was significant in the depleted gas field, but it wasn't as significant in this saline aquifer system. Now, in this particular case, it's important because we have a combination of fluids and um, we will be producing both 
um, hydrogen and methane in this case. Over here is just hydrogen and the permeability was not a significant factor for the saline reservoir. Now, if you if you see um, th this result here, you one of the things that struck us was, again, something like the formation thickness. On both cases, they, whether we increase it or decrease it, we're going to have less PI than the base case. And we saw it again in the saline reservoir. So we decided to do further analysis to look at different parameters. And the particular case we are looking at is a case where the permeability is 500 millidarsis. Um, the optimal point is somewhere at 100 meters of thickness. It's somewhere here. So it means if we increase it, we're going slightly below. Or if we reduce it, we're also going below that optimal point. And so that's why everything seemed to be on the left in that case. But we also see here, interestingly, that you know, depending on what your formation thickness is and what your formation permeability is, your productivity index is going to differ. We look again at the dip. Um, the dip was more significant when we have higher permeabilities. Permeabilities are both 250, 500, 1000. But when you have permeabilities in the range of um, 10, 50, and even 100, the dip was not a significant parameter. And these things began to make us think of what would be possible um, site selection criteria. In addition to that, we looked at things like the KVKH ratio. We found that it was not very significant across, you know, if you change your KVKH ratio, you weren't really going to get significant PI. And on this chart on the right is looking at the energy. So the energy is in blue and um, the productivity index is in um, yellow. So this is the energy we would need to compress hydrogen to be able to inject it for, um, you know, for storage purposes. Um, the scale here is going from smaller to larger, while here is from smaller to larger. And this is for us to see the trend because we want to reduce or minimize the amount of compression energy why we want to maximize our productivity index. And so on this side, we have the depth, we have the pressures. If we're in a hydrostatic system, the pressure and the depth will be the same. But if we're in a depleted system, they may not necessarily be the same. They might dip, differ depending on what the pressure is at a given depth. But what we can see is that when we, when we are you know, at uh, a depth of um, 2,500 meters, our PI is going low. And we know that if we continue to extend it and go much deeper, we will be getting lower PI. So overall, what we can see is that it will be better to stay somewhere here in this region, um, as shallow as you can get, um, lower pressures to be able to maximize your productivity index and minimize the compression energy. With that in mind, we decided to develop some site selection criteria. I'm going to talk about um, what this site selection criteria, how we applied it, and the impact of um, uncertainties. So it was applied to the Northern California fields where we have 182 depleted and underground storage fields. We The first um, part of the site selection criteria was to look at what are the factors? What can I screen out to, you know, if I have so many fields, what should I just do to screen out those fields and choose the best ones that I would want to go ahead and rank? And so we looked into two categories for the storage and withdrawal to be able to optimize that and to minimize um, losses or any kind of risk related to hydrogen storage. And with all these criteria, we developed different matrices. Now, again, um, I've had people ask me, how can you um, use 50 millidarsis, which is a good number to screen out a field? Well, if you have 182, and we have seen from the previous graphs that you, know, you really need to be above um, 50 and 100 to be having significant PI, then if you have so many of them, you can use this to screen out. If, on the other hand, your, all your 182 fields 
are all below 50 milliDarsis, then you would need to rework the thresholds that will be used for screening out. But these are basically what it is. Um, no, um, not very deep reservoirs, um, as shallow as it can get to be able to maximize your um, PI. So from this 182, applying this first set of screening criteria, 35 fields passed and was were taken on to the next day. So these are all the 182 fields and we screened to get 30. Now in the second stage, we begin to apply scoring for different for the different fields. So all those 35 fields, we took them and we scored them against several criteria. We used um, seven out of nine due to data availability, but we also knew that not all parameters have the same impact on the productivity index of hydrogen. And so we use the, the, you know, this figure looking at which ones have more impact than the rest to create a kind of weighting factor. This weighting factor was then applied and then we came up with um, a ranking of the different reservoirs. On this slide, I showed top um, 10 out of the 35. But what we did is, you know, the green is the ones that ranked high. The yellows are the ones that are in medium and the red are the ones that were poor uh, um, amongst the 35. So here we have the top 10. I'm highlighting here in yellow some three fields, the sycamore, soda city gas and wild goose gas, because we're going to look at the impact of uncertainty. When we carried out the site selection um, uh, screen and site selection, we used average values for those fields, average permeabilities, average porosities, average everything. Now, when we decided to um, consider the range, because in the data we are using, they would say something like, okay, your porosity could be somewhere between 10 to 50, um, to, <laughs> to 30, or your permeability could be somewhere from um, 18 to 250. So when we decided to look at what if we are using the low values or what if we are using the high values, what would this look like? So um, these three fields, Sycamore was still here when we think about using our P10s. It's still here, Rio Vista is here, but the other two in yellow have been removed. When we also do the P90 estimates, Sycamore is not even here in the list. Rio Vista that topped um, was top ranking, came down to somewhere third position and things like that. So what it goes to show is that when we have uncertainties, they can change the ranking of sites we want to select for hydrogen storage. And this then drives the need for proper site characterization even prior to site selection. I would um, go into the third part, which is key findings from preliminary geomechanical analysis. And in this part, um, we, um, we built a geomechanical model. Um, the reservoir model was embedded within the geomechanical model. So we, this part that I highlight in brown is the reservoir model. And all of this is the, geomechan um, the geomechanical part of it to enable us not to feel the um, impact of the pressures or the stresses in the far field. So the data that um, had been used here, this was hypothetical. So we used values that um, are available in literature. So the um, vertical stress, this is the value, uh, maximum horizontal stress and minimum horizontal stress. This is the size of the simulation domain. We have a shale above the sand. I just put the sand um, properties here for you to um, you know, see them. But when, what I'll just highlight is that for the shale, the young modulus was higher and the unconfined confined compressive strength was higher than what we have for the um, sandstone reservoir. And so we ran it on different, um, different uh, time steps for um, the model. And this is the first thing I want to show is what's happening. So when we start out, um, the assumption is that if we're in a zone that has had any sort of um, seismic activity, existence of fault or fracture or fractures, it should be in a um, critically stressed state unless proven otherwise. And so this line here is the line of 
it's in its um, critically stressed state, and that's the initial state. So this dark blue line, sorry, I couldn't change all the colors. This dark blue line indicates how it was when it started. Now, when we begin to inject um, the, the um, hydrogen, we, um, we begin to move towards the left of uh, the line of our principal stress. So we move here. And at many cases, we do not necessarily exceed that um, line of being critically stressed. Now, remember that this is a cyclic event. So we go inject, withdraw, inject, withdraw. And so it is much later on that when we are in the injection phase that we do cross this line. However, when we go into the production phase or the withdrawal phase, um, that is when we reduce this, um, this difference between the maximum and the minimum um, principal stresses. And so we do exceed this line of the critic, this um, line that indicates it is critically stressed. And so it tells us that during production is when we would most likely um, begin to experience this induced seismicity or micro seismicity um, in this system even um, before the um, injection. What other things did we look at? So this is the rock displacement during um, injection, and this is during withdrawal, and this is the range of values. This is in meters. Okay. This is in meters. So this is injection and withdrawal. And um, overall, the uplift that we are seeing when we inject is less than four millimeters and compaction is less than two millimeters. Um, um, I looked at another case where if the young modulus of elasticity is 20 in that reservoir, what would this be? And the interesting thing was that we would have more, you know, more incidence of, um, you know, we would exceed this critically stressed line very quickly. Now, um, one other thing that I would just like to highlight is that the place where I'm taking this information from is just is at the injection point where we are injecting the gas. So not the shale and not far below. So where we are injecting the gas. So this is what it is. And um, similarly, the, the um, uplift, the compactions, they are still within the same range. But just that if our young modulus is much higher, we have higher chances of exceeding that critical stress state line, which means we would have some level of seismicity during injection and production. So how would site characterization and monitoring help? Of course, um, prior to um, going to any site to inject, I cannot overstress the need for characterization if it's true cause or previous data, especially when it's with a depleted field where things could have changed as a result of the depletion. It's good to get better understanding of what's the current state of the pressure, the porosities and the permeabilities, if it's possible. And here I list some measurements that we could quickly, uh, that we could use, you know, petrophysical and other measurements. But when I look at this, I say that there's a gap in hydrogen plume identification. For CO2 storage, we have things like the um, reservoir saturation monitoring tool using um, Sigma information to know where CO2 is, but we don't have such luxury for hydrogen yet. So it's something people can think about. But if we look at all these uncertainties that could come about in the cause of injection, withdrawal, then we need this need for characterization um, and measurements as well as monitoring. So um, on this note, I'll come to a conclusion. Uh, we can see that from this study, we have identified critical reservoir and geologic parameters that impact hydrogen productivity in depleted gas fields and saline aquifers. We can see things like the uh, permeability, the deep of the reservoir, um, um, the depth of the reservoir and the pressure are very key factors. Um, the permeability was significant for the depleted gas field, but was not that much significant for um, saline aquifers.
So the impact of this parameter suggests that with the uncertainties that we see, it could impact proper characterization, monitoring of the sites, and even selection of those sites. And so it's something we have to think of, how do we reduce the uncertainties at different stages, in the screening stages, in the ranking stages, and when we go ahead to implement this, the, the work itself and we want to monitor the site. So different scales of reservoir char characterization will be valuable in reducing these uncertainties, um, lab scale investigations, cores, nano scales, you know, different scales and going up to the field scale and monitoring tools would be needed. I would like to use this opportunity to thank um, the support of Southern Company, the Stanford Center for Carbon Storage, the Sutri A Industrial Affiliate, where I started um, this work. And I have continued to expand on this work at Texas a and um, being supported by the Texas a and Energy Institute and the Harold Barnes Department of Petroleum Engineering. These are the references um, that I have listed in this work. And I want to thank you all for listening. And I look forward to your questions, feedback, and comments. Thank, thank you very you much, Rita, for this very nice presentation. I see already plenty of questions posted. Sebastian, please go ahead. And I still remember my own question about your novels, but I keep it for the last one. Please. OK. Sebastian. Yeah. Thank you very much, Rita, for a really nice talk. And as Hadi said, um, questions are coming in thick and fast. Um, so I start with one from Willemind van Rooyen, um, who asks, um, first says, uh, thank you very much for the interesting talk, and then continues, I'm interested to know how you selected Peng Robinson as an equation of state. Did you also consider other options, and did you have to perform any calibration for density, viscosity, or solubility? Yes, so if we use the um, Peng Robinson equation of state as is, um, Compared to the SRK, I, I find that, that the SRK is much better, but there is still some fine tuning using um, a volume shift factor that was applied to the Peng Robinson equation to be able to match the densities and viscosities before using in the um, equation in the model. Okay. Thank you. And staying on to the topics that were on the fluid properties, um, let me just get the right question up here. Thea says, um, thank you for your talk. Um, what was the choice of cushion gas in your study? Um, are your models for mixing coefficients and solubility functions of temperature, pressure, mixture composition? Yes. Yeah, so in the case of the depleted field, the cushion gas is assumed to be the gas that may have been left, which is methane. The mixing is taken into account and all the solubility is taken into account in the model. Um, in, in the references that I put, you would uh, I explain all of that in detail. For the saline aquifer, there was no additional cushion gas. The hydrogen was serving both the purpose of the cushion gas and the gas that's going to be withdrawn. And then um, I'm going to jump over to um, a question by Sai Changda. Um, says, do you have any unexpected different behaviors with hydrogen? In your simulation was it typical of any other gas? Um, let me see. So I had I had I had model um, CO two, and then I went to model hydrogen. I think I found found that hydrogen was much easier than CO two. You know because of the fact of we we are mostly in the supercritical phase for hydrogen, but with CO two there were chances of phase changes, if you're going to inject into a depleted field, there was um, 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 possibilities of changing from gas to supercritical and things like that. So I found that, that hydrogen was much easier to manage. Um, what I still find difficult are the interactions, because hydrogen has more complex interactions, perhaps not properly understood as, as compared to CO2. And I would guess it's because of its novelty of, um, of um, being studied in porous media. Is there anything, um, and I'm going to sneak in a question from me here, is there anything in terms of the density differences? Um, because hydrogen is much less dense compared to CO2, and I think also yeah. compared to methane. Yes, yes. very. It's less dense, less viscous, 
the viscosity is not changing a lot and the density is not changing a lot even with changes in pressure and temperature. So, yeah. Going back to a little bit about more so your general, um, the general setup of your simulations. Um, again, a couple of questions from Willemine and Teas. Um, asks, I'm also interested to learn if you considered hysteresis. Do you expect any major influence of hysteresis? So in this model, hysteresis wasn't considered, but um, I've also looked at that separately and hysteresis has some impact. It's not something to be overlooked. So it's not covered here, but it does have impact. And I'm sure there are um, some other works that have been published that look into it, um, that talk about it. So, yeah. And then the last sort of technical question around the simulations, simulation setup, um, again from Willemine, really interested in working out what you've done. Just, um, have you considered plasticity in your geomechanical model as well? Okay, okay so no. In this particular model, we um, we use the elastic brittle um, 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 system. I haven't considered plasticity. I wanted to understand how it would be if we're going to assume this elastic um, brittle um, behavior. And now that I have seen it, I can then make it more complex by moving towards the plasticity in the okay. yeah in the model. No questions related to um, site selection. And again, lots of questions around this. I'm going to pick one here from Teas. It says, based on your results, and do you agree that shallow reservoirs are better suited for underground hydrogen storage, provided, of course, that enough sealing exists? Yes. So um, that is my feeling. Um, shallower reservoirs are better to enable us to withdraw it. But before we select a shallow reservoir, we have to think about where is our water table? Do we have sufficient ceiling? Do we understand the integrity of that cap rock? You know, so once those characterization have been properly um, dealt with, then of course, shallower reservoirs are much better in terms of both um, the energy for compression and um, ability to withdraw that fluid. Um. Thank you. And then Said has a question around site selection. Wonders, um, do you also look at the availability of existing infrastructure, the right infrastructure, when um, you take this into consideration when you look at site selections? Yes. Um, so um, I'm sorry I didn't put that um, criteria on this um, screening list, but it was part of the things that helped to reduce from 186 to 35. We had to look at were there existing um, infrastructure, possible pipeline routes, um, distance from source to, to the reservoir. So those other ones were um, taken, we call them the economic considerations, were also utilized in the screening process. Okay. Thank you. And then um, you mentioned this in passing, so to, in, well, the answer to um, Tia's question is shallower reservoirs, given they have the right integrity, are beneficial because. Um, of the um, reduced need for compression. So question from Hardy Karimzade, not, not our Hardy, different Hardy. Um, it's a two-part question. Is underground hydrogen storage is low all efficiency because it requires a lot of electricity to produce hydrogen, turn it back into electricity. Um, are there any new and efficient ways to improve the conversion of hydrogen to electricity or vice versa? You're taking one part looking at the right site selection that becomes um, makes it more effective. Are there any any other um, um, new findings in terms of conversion process? Okay, so when I looked at the, um, um, in, in, what, in my second reference, I looked at the conversion from energy, uh, you know, energy power to hydrogen and bringing it back. I saw that the efficiencies are quite low. When I looked at the whole process, I realized that these inefficiencies are from the conversion and then on the part of, um, let's say, you're using it through um, a turbine to generate electricity. So I think that it's beyond um, we that are looking at, let's say, the subsurface. We can do all our optimizations. We can do everything. It's beyond us. It now it rests on those who are doing the conversion processes to see how can they improve um, the efficiencies of um, electrolysis 
or improve the efficiencies of the kind of turbines that will be used to generate power and things like that. But I think that is beyond people who are looking at the subsurface um, themselves to be able to address those challenges. We need to keep a bit of research for our chemical engineers and um, electrical <laughs> engineers. Um, but so thinking about how we manage the subsurface more effectively, or, or, and again, you just highlighted this really nicely with the, looking at the um, PIs. Um, so I wonder, um, would it make any difference if you have um, different injection producer well? Um, could we potentially recover more? hydrogen that well um, in this way? Um, how much hydrogen did you lose in estimated being lost in your simulations? OK. So the kind of um, losses that I was able to evaluate in my simulations were due to, mostly due to mixing. Um, the, the things due to solubility was quite small. Um, um, well, it was mostly the mixing and diffusion. Um, the number of wells might help to if you know might help to, if we want to look at um you know bottom hole pressures we don't if we want to try to optimize bottom hole pressures and i feel that you know these are things that we can do optimization studies for for the amount of the amount because one of the things that i noticed when we did sensitivity was that when we reduced the rates the pis were higher which means that perhaps if i have um, two wells, it might be more efficient than one well in terms of PI, but we also have to think about the cost. So there's always this balance between um, efficiency and cost, you know, or production withdrawal and cost. So we will just have to bring the whole techno economics together to be able to figure out what is really optimal. Okay, thank you. I don't see any questions coming through at the moment here in the chat. And there's a comment um, from Abisyama Udoma. It says it's quite an exciting learning session. Um, and there are lots of comments thanking you for a really interesting talk. So um, I think, Hardy, this is now your opportunity to learn more about the novels that um, Rita has written. <laughs> oh, yes, exactly. So Rita, what are those novels? OK, so the first one is, um, is Against the Perfect Wheel. It is geared towards teenagers and young adults. And I think the overall theme of that one is just how one decision we take in our life could either affect us for good or for bad. Um, so that one, I wrote it, well, I think, more than 10 years, about 15 years ago. Mm. And then the second one is um, Morning Does Come. It just encourages people who are going through certain things in life that, you know, there's light at the end of the tunnel. You could go through very difficult situations, but where, where there's life, there's hope. And someday you will see that light. So those are the two novels. They are all available on Amazon. Interesting. Sebastian, she would be the, a perfect panelist in Interpol Conference one of these coming years. Yeah, absolutely. This is absolutely, absolutely interesting. To see you have all, all these novels written as well. That's really nice, really nice. Thank uh, you. You should also write a novel about hydrogen energy transition, also somehow, <laughs> as well, or the crisis that we are having to, to change the course from oil and gas to renewable energy as well. And Thank you. Sort of understanding a lot of, uh, as you said, you, your novels addresses also the, the dilemma that younger generation have in order to just, you know, from their own perfectionists and all the things I just learned from what you just explained. And this climate crisis at the same time being, being practical for energy supply is also another type of challenge that we have. Maybe it's not all about technical aspects we should contribute, but also uh, literature and uh, this sort of non-technical or non-mathematical approach to this yeah. type of challenges in life would be also important. So thanks a lot for sharing these two novels as well. Plus you're also wise words about hydrogen storage I'd like to end the session today. Uh, we have one last session before the summer holidays. It's going to be next week um, by Carl Jackman from Imperial College London. Carl will explain a rapid reservoir uh, prototyper where you do a sketch modeling based uh, strategies. Uh, Sebastian has been on it for many years. And that would be then the end of the summer's uh, time. And then we will have two or three months, hopefully sunny summer, hopefully 
in Europe we have had our two weeks of summer so far, so that's already, we are proud of it already. So we will see <laughs> how it will go. So thanks a lot, everyone. Thank you, Rita. Next week we are going to have our last session before the summer break. All right. Enjoy Thank wherever you. you are. Stay happy, healthy, and tune into our channel next week. All the best. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye bye. Okay.